Hey, this is John. Thanks for joining me for this video today. I'm going to be talking about adding a dot filter to your model um, using this Bandai 1 1 44th scale Star Wars AT AT Walker. I thought this would be a, a good kit to demonstrate it on because it's got these big flat sides here. Um, and uh, I can show you uh, a couple of methods for doing it. Now, at this point, it's, it's just been airbrushed. Um, I haven't added any dot filter or anything like that. There's just several layers of um, airbrush that have been built up to give it kind of a, a worn look already. And then I want to enhance that uh, a little more with uh, the dot filters. Now, the, the, the biggest thing that it, when I talk to people um, online and in person about dot filtering, I think um, the biggest hump to get over is not necessarily the technique, but the, uh, I guess you'd say the theory behind what it's supposed to represent. Uh, why do it? What, what is a dot filter? So I wanted to take just a few minutes and, and talk about that a little bit. Um, a, a filter is just when you're going to take some very thin color, put it over your model, and that filter will alter or change the way the, the surface of the model looks. If you've ever been to, um, for example, a play, and they may have a spotlight on somebody, and then they put a red filter in front of it, and all of a sudden everything has a red tint to it. That's what a filter is. Um, just a, a single, you can apply a filter. You'll see armor modelers do that a lot. They'll apply a single filter over a whole model, and it's just to unify the colors, maybe change the, the, the color a little bit, um, give it more of a cool look or a warm look or whatever. So that's what a filter is. A dot filter is simply taking dots of color and putting it along the model and doing some streaking, all of which we'll go over here shortly. And it gives a, 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 sort of like what you see here. I've already done, I guess you'd say I've done in a way something that will end up looking like a dot filter with the airbrush. You see the streaked appearance that you see a few different colors there? That's what a dot filter does. Um, and the, the idea is to make it look like something that's been sitting outside for a long time, um, been in the rain, been in, you know, the, <laughs> as with this, been in the snow, uh, or been stomping around, you know, a forest world and stomping on little teddy bears. <laughs> so it's, it's supposed to show rain and wear. Um, there's, a, there's a building near my office that has one side of it doesn't have, I don't remember if it doesn't have any windows or only a few, but it's a, just a big slab side of concrete, several stories tall. And I always like looking at it because it's got a very streaked appearance. I think it's a great example of weathering of a really large thing. So that kind of a dot filter simulates that kind of weathering. So it's, it's just a way of, of expressing, hey, this thing's old. It's, it's been outside, it's been in the sun, it's seen heat, it's seen cold, it's seen wet, it's seen dry, and it has caused the paint to do various things in various places, um, whether it be stains dripping down from one of these openings or people going up and down here or whatever. It's, it's had some effect on the paint. So a dot filter simply tries to replicate that. Okay, another thing in the, the consideration of a dot filter is what do you use to apply the dot filter? Now, traditionally oils have been used, and that's what I'm going to use in this video, and I'm going to talk about that here in a moment. But you can do this with any kind of color that you can apply. Um, I've done things that looked like um, a dot filter. There's a way of doing it with things uh, like enamel washes. Um, you can use something like this. Uh, I've done it. In fact, I did a video on it. If you if you check in my uh, uh, video list of streaking with acrylics, um, you can use. I, I like using these Vallejo model washes. You can do it with these. A pretty good job with these. So there's a lot of different products that you can use in terms of a dot filter. But traditionally, you see folks using things 
like these oil colors. And any, just about any brand will do. Um, the only time I've ever had problems was when I used some really cheap oil paints. Um, this, these, these in particular. Um, these are fairly cheap, and they work good for some things, but when I did dot filters with these, um, yeah, I made it work, but it took, it took a little more effort, and they weren't quite, uh, <laughs> weren't quite the experience I wanted. But high-quality oils like uh, Winsor Newton 502 Abbey Lung um, or, or Miggs oil brushers, um, these work uh, really well. So if, if you have some of these, um, these will work perfectly. Okay, another thing to talk about in terms of the theory of dot filters is color selection. Now, you, you may have seen, and, and I'm not knocking doing this because there's some very good modelers who do this, and, and, and so there, there's a place for just saying, okay, I'm just going to pick some, you know, some blue, some green, some red, some yellow, and, and put those dot filters on. If that generates the effect you're looking for, then do it. But what I think sometimes I've not always seen explained is why those colors were picked. Um, generally, when you're applying a dot filter, you're, you, I like to think in terms of do I want a cool tone, blues, grays, um, that kind of thing. Do I want a warm tone, browns and reds and stuff like that? Um, you have to think about what the color is of the base that it's going over. This is a gray. Um, I'm planning to use cooler tones. I don't want to add um, some color variation to it. I, I, don't wanna, I don't want you to be able to see some you know, very obvious streaks of yellow or red or green or blue or anything like that. I'm mostly wanting to enhance the spectrum between white and black. In other words, 50 shades gray. That's another story. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to be using uh, cool tones like that. Maybe a little bit of blue, uh, because anytime you see blue, you can think gray, because that's how it will filter. Um, anyway, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use blues and grays and, and uh, things like that, because I want to distress the paint and then I'll use later steps that may add some warm, warm tones, such as, you know, maybe showing some rust coming down from these things, whatever they are. Um, you know, those will be deliberate weathering, not paint distressing. So when you're thinking in terms of a dot filter, think in terms of changing the tone of the model and then think, okay, later weathering would add what to it, rust and things like that that would potentially go over the dot filter later when the dot filter has dried. Here's, as I've talked about, here's an example of one that is uh, more of a, a palette for cool colors. A model I had built previously is this Machine and Krieger kit. And um, you'll notice that it's been streaked uh, and heavily weathered. I mean, it, this one's obviously finished. But on this one, I used warmer tones. I went for reds, I went for yellows, I went for oranges. Um, I went for, you know, browns, things that... Um, I threw in a little bit of gray uh, just to murk things up a bit. But you can see that it, it left a, a particular effect that worked well with the colors underneath here. Um, and in fact, I used acrylics on this. This was uh, some streaking with acrylics. So it, when you're making the selection of what colors to use in your dot filter, um, think about what's underneath it, what effect are you trying to achieve, and then what's going to go over it later, and that'll help you decide the colors. Now, the reality is, first time you do it, you, you may pick some colors and you know, do the dot filter technique and say, gee, that's not quite what I was hoping for. Um, 
and that's fine. It, it may take a couple of hours. The first few times I did it, I, I, I wasn't really happy with the result. It was okay, but I wasn't really happy with it, and I had to go back and, and you know, adjust the application the next time. But once you start figuring out, I guess you'd say, a rhythm of the colors that you want to use for any particular model, it makes things a lot easier. Okay, the last thing I want to look at before getting into the demonstration is the hardware that, that uh, I'll be using. Um, and you'll be using too if you follow this, this demonstration. Anyway, um, of course, you'll need your paints. Uh, any brands will work, like I talked about earlier, uh, generally. Good quality brands, you can mix and match them. You'll need some odorless thinner. Uh, I've got this Ammo Amig odorless thinner. Uh, that I use. I also have used this Weber odorless terpenoid. Um, you can save some money by getting into this big, big container here. Any odorless uh, type thinner uh, will work. I like to have a bit of cardboard for my palette for the tube oils, um, especially these these more artist, you know, proper artist kind of oils. Um, they have a lot of, uh, I think it's linseed oil, it's some kind of stuff, that it, that's what takes it so long to dry. When you put it on these pallets, then um, the oil will leach out into it and it'll help the stuff dry. Uh, when I'm using these kind of oils, I put it on the pallet uh, maybe half an hour, an hour ahead of time and just let it leach out a little bit. It just helps with the drying time. Um, these Ammo MIG uh, oil brushers. You can actually use these right out of the bottle. Uh, I sometimes put them into a plastic or metal palette just so I can dip into them easier and do more spot applications, but these don't necessarily need to be on the cardboard. Um, but having one of these can be helpful. If you're using a variety of colors and they're very similar, label your colors so you know which one is which. Um, I like to have a cocktail stick or a toothpick, depending on where you live in the world. Um, that I can dip into the oils and apply to the model. And sometimes I'll use one toothpick for each color. That's, that's something you'll need standing by. I like to have a variety of round brushes. And they can be, these are, these are old brushes. They're synthetic brushes. There's nothing special about it. You don't need, you know, the Series 7. In fact, don't use the Series 7 or the Raphael's or anything like that. These are the, you know, the ones you get for a couple of bucks from the the craft store. Um, I like having just a variety of sizes standing by for cleanup and other things, which I'll be showing you in the video. Then I like to have a, a, a fatter brush like this, and you can see that this one has been well used um, for doing the actual streaking. Um, the size of the brush is not as important as needing it to be fairly wide. Um, so if you prefer one that's that's this size, um, a little bigger than this, that's fine. If you like the angle brush like that, that's fine. Um, you just need a fairly wide, flat brush uh, for, for doing the actual uh, streaking of the dots. And then finally, of course, you'll need your model. And for this, our lovely demonstrator will be Bandai's 1144th scale Adat Walker. Um, which I must say is a great little kit. So with all that rabble, rabble, rabble out of the way, it's time to get to the streaking. Keep your clothes on. That's not the kind of streaking I'm talking about, you weirdo. <laughs> okay, I have everything prepared here. Uh, I've got my tube oils on this just cardboard pallet. I've got raw umber, starship filth, and white and some toothpicks for application. For the oil brushers, I'm gonna be using dark mud, dark blue, and medium gray. And then over here to the side, I've got a couple of wells in my palette filled with odorless thinner for cleanup, doing whatever I need to do. All right, now for the application, uh, something to, to think about. While you want it to be random, at the same time, I think it's important to think of distribution and density. In other words, if, if you're wanting this to look really, really streaky, you're gonna want a higher density of dots. 
if you're wanting it to look a little less streaky, there's a lower density of dots. And so when you think in terms of that density, you have to think in terms of distribution. On this surface, you can only put so many dots before it just becomes a muddy mess. And you have to think in terms of, okay, do I want a dot every, you know, four dots every square inch? Or do I want 10 dots every square inch, regardless of color? And, and again, you're not trying to be too precise. I'm not going to sit here and go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, like that. But it helps to think in those terms, I think, because you'll do this side. And then when you flip over here, while you don't want it to necessarily look symmetrical, it wouldn't make sense unless you have other elements that tell the story as to why for one side to be hugely streaked and the other one minimally so. So I, I always try to think in terms of distribution and density um, and generally what happens is I let the first section that I do kind of inform how that will work. Now this surface has not been gloss coated. It's I haven't put any kind of clear coat over it. It's just the lacquer paint. So it's a little bit satiny. It's leaning more towards flat than gloss, but it's it's a satin finish. Now to make the application, I try to do more, uh, I try to do smaller dots rather than really large dots. And I'm, I'm going to just put them on here. And again, I'm thinking in terms of how many dots am I putting on? Um, and I'm doing it more of a visual than, than necessarily counting the dots. And don't forget, get up near the top, you know, get down near the bottom. And also keep in mind that you're going to have more dots coming. Now, some people like doing one color of dot and then adding another color and then adding another color. That's fine if you want to do it that way. Um, I tend to think that's a little tedious, but you do it however you want and certainly use trial and error to, uh, to inform how you want to do it. Another thing to think of, this Starship felt and this raw umber, when they're streaked, there's not going to be a huge distinction in color with them. So keep that in mind when you're when you're putting on two very similar colors that they may end up looking about the same. Also, something to pay attention to. Keep in mind the distribution and the, and the density of light versus dark colors. Um, I've got a lot of really dark colors going on here. I thought about that during uh, the initial painting. I knew I would be doing darker colors, so I deliberately went for a lighter look. Now, these Ammo MIG oil brushers, sometimes I'll put the oils off on a palette because these brushes, sometimes you pull out the brush and it's fairly pointed. Sometimes, like this one, it's a little less so. And in those cases, you can either be careful with what you're doing or use a tinier brush. I'm going to just try to be careful here. And you'll notice that I'm just making some big, some small. Not really worried too much about getting too many on there. Come back here, you. Now this brown, I'm going to go very light with because I don't want to introduce too many red, too many warm tones. So I want just a little bit of this brown. And also, this is not where you can during this stage think of streaking from the different features on the surface of the model, but I'm not thinking in those terms right now. I'm, I'm going purely for I want lots of dots. I'm going to use that gray. The oil brushers are on the other side of the camera and I probably should have positioned them a little better. This blue is a very powerful blue. So that one I'm going to use just a little of. In fact, I don't like that dot up there. 
that first big dot. I'm going to put one down here and one over here. If you get some on like that, that you're not really happy with, have a brush standing by that you can just lift off some of that. And it's okay if I smear it around like that. We're going to be smearing the paints around anyway. So I'll just clean that off camera. Okay, mumbling aside, you see I've got a bunch of dots and one big smear. Now, I'm going to get my large flat brush and I'm going to start streaking these. Now, this is the part where most people that are doing dot filters for the first time freak out. Um, if you've never seen this, trust me, I haven't lost my mind. You take this big flat brush and you just start pulling down from top to bottom. Now, I don't like doing it in a fast motion. I see some people do it in a very fast motion. But one, I think that mixes the colors a little too much. And I don't want to do that. I want to leave some of the streaks distinct. Now, it's getting a little bit of oil on there. So what I do is I just get a paper towel and I clean off some of that excess. I've, I've not used any thinner. But I just keep drawing that down. Just like this. Once they start getting blended, then I can start looking at, and you can change the approach of the brush. I like to do this, and then sometimes I like to do that and bear down a little more. Once I get it to this stage, and it, de it depends on the paint and the surface. If the paints aren't streaking um, readily, and sometimes those ammo paints, they won't. I get a second flat brush, I dip it in my thinner. I went over here to the, the palette that's over here and I dipped it in the thinner. And then I'm offloading most of that onto a pal onto a, a paper towel so that it's just barely damp with it. And then I can begin streaking some more. And by introducing that thinner in, they start pulling down a lot more. I just flip the brush over and I keep doing that. And if it's Needing a little more thinner, I add a little more thinner. Yeah, you can see the thinner's a little heavier there. Now, if you get a spot like this blue, remember earlier I mentioned this blue is very powerful? You can work that. You can work that and just pull it down. But I continue doing this, pulling it down the side. Almost forgot that. And don't worry if it's if it's getting caught up on uh, various uh, greeblies and things on the model. That's okay. That's going to happen. let it happen. Later weathering is going to go back in and make all of that come together. But you can see I just keep working it. Now this is very grippy paint. And by grippy what I mean is it's holding the oils. I'm okay with that. This is a patient slow working process. If this were gloss, they would streak a lot more, but you wouldn't get as much character into the finish. Now, what I'll do, because oils have a long drying time, I'll leave this like that. And you can see, you can see the difference it's made. It's added more streaks, it's added more colors and tones, both the same, um, to, the, to the surface. So, I can, I can leave it like this. I can come back later, let it dry. I'll let the thinner dry for a while. I can come back later and decide, do I want to streak it even more? Uh, do I want to uh, you know, add more to it? 
do I want to continue working it with the brush and reduce the amount of streaking that's there? Um, you, you have a lot of flexibility with oils. Now the, the ammo oils, they dry faster. These Windsor and, the Windsor and Newton oil that I use, the, the raw umber and the white, I could, I could wait easily a day and still be able to get some working into them. These ammo ones, they dry much quicker. So you want to make a decision within an hour or two about what you're going to do. Um, and even then, you may be pushing the envelope a little bit. But I think you see the, the difference it makes in adding streaks and really making this guy look, uh, look beat up and old and aged and with a, a, a very nice, varied surface. All right, one other method I want to show for uh, streaking that again you can try it 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 doesn't the end result is about the same but I've seen people do this and I like doing it sometimes depending on um, how streaky I want things to look and the colors that I'm working with and that's just to simply before you do any of the uh, the dots just go in and give it a good coat of odorless thinner. Now this is Bandai plastic and I'm putting a lot of thinner on so I'm taking some chances with it but I'm trying even though I'm getting the surface very wet I'm trying not to get it down into cracks and grooves and things where it might start eating the plastic so that's something to be aware of and then you just go in and you do the same process that I did before and I'm doing this a little quicker um, and add your dots in and by putting them on the thinner they're going to be a little wetter and you're going to get a little different result with your streaking but I would recommend if you've never done this before to try both methods and see which one you like there's even a third method that I've seen where somebody thinned the paints and actually applied the paints in a more streaked fashion right out of the gate. So instead of putting them on the model and then essentially smearing them with a little bit of thinner, they thinned them first and then put them on the model, streaking them as they went. It's, a, it's another method. Um, the end game is going to be about what you see over here but it's just different ways of doing it uh, and again I would I would recommend giving any of them a try pardon the reach here I, I find that these oil brushers despite the the way they advertise that they they're very clean and they generally are they're that way if you store them vertically I had one bottle that I didn't use for a while and I stored it on its side. I used it once, closed the lid up. When I opened it again, um, the lid had a, just this massive crust around it. The stuff had started running out. Anyway, I'm going to go back and I'm going to streak as before. This streaks much easier. Note how strong that blue is. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is when you streak like this, the brush is going to pick up some of those streaks and add additional streaks. So keep that in mind when you're planning your density and distribution thinking. Now, you see that was faster. Um, there's a little less control because it starts streaking quicker. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a very good technique in terms of speed and things like that. Um, Try them both, you decide which one you like. I, I tend to do this one more um, because I can see the level of streak happening and decide where I want it. This one goes much faster. Uh, in either case, if you're wanting to, if, if you don't like what's happened, you can take a piece of paper towel and dip it in thinner and just start wiping the stuff off you can get most of the oil off. And if you get a little that collects around the greeblies, um, you just get a, a small brush 
like this and you dip it in thinner and you just clean around those areas. So this is a very recoverable technique and it's very, very flexible. You can use a lot of different colors um, to get the streaking accomplished, but you end up with, uh, again, I think a pretty cool effect on your model. Okay, I have the sides streaked on this one side and I'm happy with how that looks. Um, it's only been a little while since I did this. I did this section over here off camera, um, with the camera off rather, and uh, it's only been just a few minutes, essentially the real time you saw me doing it in, plus a couple of more minutes. So I'm gonna let that dry for a little while and see if I want any adjustments to that. Now, on the top, I've already done some color distressing with the airbrush, but I wanna add more. Now, depending on the type of craft you're doing, if this were, let's say a car, or of the flat top of a vehicle that traveled fairly fast, I would probably streak back like this, assuming that it's you know flying along and it's in the rain or it's on the ground and it's moving really fast. This guy don't move fast. Um, there's nothing fast about an ad at walker. So what I'm gonna do here, this is where I really prefer the wet technique. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in and I'm going to wet the surface like I showed you earlier. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to add my dots as I did before. But I'm going to do it a little less dense. And that will make sense hopefully in a moment here why I'm doing it that way. And I'm going to just for the sake of speed, I'm going to use a, a few less colors. I think after I've seen the streaking and how some of the colors interact, I think I don't need quite as many as I originally got out. I think I could have done just as well with either the Starship Filth or the Raw Umber. Um, and that, that mud color, I think it would serve better later, but I'll use it a little bit. Just going to add a little bit of this blue. That blue is really powerful. As to quote Bob Ross, it'll it'll take over your whole day. Um, if you've never watched Bob Ross painting show, you need to give it a watch. It's relaxing, and you'll learn a lot from it in terms of colors and blending and mixing and all of that. And he does a really good job of mixing in teaching without it seeming. A whole lot like teaching. So anyway, start talking about Bob Ross and all of a sudden your voice, your voice gets all quiet. Um, all right, so I've got this. Let me get this where I can hold it and keep it on camera. Now I take my brush and instead of streaking, I bounce it like this. Now that blue, I'm already regretting that blue choice right there but I'll work with it. And as you bounce it, you start getting a varied look to it like that. And if you need to dip it in thinner and offload some of the color, because see, this brush is getting quite a bit of color pickup on it. You see right there? So by dipping it in thinner and offloading that, I can then come back in and all I'm doing is just kind of blending this in like that. And you just keep working it until you get it like you want it. Now, these blue areas that I'm not real happy with, I'll blend them a little more. Once it dries, I may go back in and add additional color over it just to mask it a little bit. But you just work it like that to get it however you want it. And it's a fairly close, it works with the way the sides look. And it's just, it just looks like water or, you know, snow or Ewok droppings have, have pulled up on there and, um, and gives you a, a look that fits with the rest of it. Um, 
You could, like here, you could do the bounce technique and then do just a little bit of light streaking um, to, to go with the fact that these surfaces are pointed down. You could just do it completely streaked if you wanted to. The, the choice is up to you. The beautiful thing about this technique is oils are workable enough that you're completely in control of the technique and the application of it yourself. So uh, don't be afraid to experiment and to, you know, to push the envelope of what people do with, with oils. Okay, I finished uh, the application of the oils on the top and this one side. Um, this is something, I've, I've worked it kind of fast for the video. Um, this is something you're going to want to take a little more time on. Be careful with handling the model um, because obviously with these oils, with their long working time, it's real easy to uh, get them up on your fingers. Wearing rubber gloves can help if you're trying to do a lot of it at one time, but even the rubber gloves can pull up paint. So um, what I'll do is I'll actually set this aside. Um, the, the way my work schedule goes and the way my filming schedule goes, I'll set this aside for probably a week before I come back to it. Uh, certainly three or four days and let it dry and then, because um, I'll be doing other things, and then do this other side, which you can see hasn't been treated at all. So, and then the front and the back, and then the legs and the head. So there's, there's still a lot to do. Um, so, but just be aware of that when you're working on this, that, that uh, it, it's susceptible to fingerprinting uh, very, very easily. One other thing to point out, um, I, I do this when I'm, when I'm trying to work quickly. If, if I needed to get all of the sides done, what I would do is use my hair dryer. Uh, normally you don't want to use a hair dryer on oils if you're putting them on fairly thick because they can crack. But with, with it being so spread out and so thin, you can use a hair dryer on a low setting um, to dry up the, the thinner and to dry the oils and give you a little, you still don't want to put your fingers directly on it. Um, but you know, you would better be able to hold it from inside or mount it up on something. I probably should have mounted this on something, but you get the picture. A hair dryer will let you speed up the process of working with this um, quite a bit. So keep that in mind if you're, if you're going to use this technique. Okay, well, I'm going to call that a wrap on this video. Um, I hope you've seen that, that applying the dot filter technique is, is not really difficult. I mean, it's one of the, actually one of the simpler techniques. You just put some dots on and you smear them. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's just above uh, the level of, you know, working with mud pies when you were a kid. So it's, it's a fairly simple technique in terms of application. Now, I, I do think where the thought needs to go in and, and, and certainly experience will help is when you think in terms of distri distribution, density, and of course, of course color choice. Um, all of those things are very important. The, the placing the dots uh, and, and smearing them, that's just kind of secondary. But those other factors, that's going to really determine how the look of the model is going to, how it's going to end up. Um, because that's, that's going to drive it. Uh, the technique is simple, but the theory is where you, you really need to put in some, I guess you'd say, brain time. So hopefully this video has helped give you some, some information that will enhance uh, your, your ability to do uh, the dot filters if you've not tried it. Uh, if you have tried it, I hope that, that it's given you something to think about and uh, make that, that tool in your toolkit a little more useful. Well, thank you so much for watching this video, um, especially if you've gotten this far. I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, there are links down below in the description that point to my website, social media, all of those things. If you're not following me on social media and you use those, then uh, please do uh, follow, like, whatever the case may be. For my YouTube channel, please click the subscribe button somewhere down there and the little bell icon so that you'll see the videos that I put out. I try to put out at minimum one video per week. Um, some weeks I do two, and uh, I hope you'll continue coming back and taking a look at those. 
And finally, if you would be so kind as to consider supporting me on Patreon, I would be very grateful for that. There's a link down below uh, to uh, the account. It's just patreon.com slash John Bias. Uh, and so if you would consider uh, supporting me, look at the, the levels and the rewards that are offered there. And uh, uh, I would be grateful for that. And if you're already a, a, a Patreon supporter, thank you so much for, for your help and your support and, and uh, what you do because it makes everything I do possible. Uh, we just wouldn't be able to afford for me to do the, the work that I do at the pace that I do with the tools and things that I have if it weren't for uh, the support from Patreon. So thank you very much for that. So with all of that said, happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.